to renew my mind so I can control this body, and that changes my life. The best habits for success is a faith regimen that includes prayer, praise, and meditation on the Word of God. Today and all this week, I will walk, I will live in these covenant promises, and they are at work for me. They're working for me, changing rules, regulations, and moving around resources in order to enforce the covenant promises of my Yahweh. I believe this. I now receive it in Yeshua's name. Thus shall it be. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Make sure you be, be careful of what you amen to. You know, as you're talking to people and going through stuff and, I mean, listening to stuff and listening to reports, don't just say amen to anything, thus shall it be, or, or thus uh, let it be unto me. Don't, don't, go, don't amen everything. Eh? Everything don't deserve an amen. We don't want that, some things to happen, some things to come to pass. We don't want that. Amen? Amen. We don't want that. Now, this teaching here is vital. It's important. It's life-changing, life-altering, and it's serious business. It's a serious time that we're in. And we want to take this seriously. Um, God's not playing. The devil's not playing. And we shouldn't be playing. We should take this serious. This is death and life. This is destruction. This is uh, our, our, our very futures are at stake. And, and, and the most dangerous thing to us, to the body of Christ, it is not sin and it is not Satan. The most dangerous thing to us is ignorance. My people are destroyed. For lack of knowledge, he said, because you're with knowledge, I got to withdraw from you and your children. You know, if, if you, we're talking about fasting, I'm going to say some things about the body. If I'm ignorant about how my body works, I can destroy my own body. Don't be blaming that on the devil. You full of pork. He ain't. <laughs> don't blame that on, don't blame that on the devil. You, you, um, one time we was eating with somebody and uh, before they tasted their food, they just grabbed the salt shaker. <laughs> they just didn't even taste it. It was at a restaurant. The devil didn't make you use all that salt. So if I'm ignorant about how my body works, the way health works, I, I'm, I'm destroyed because of that ignorance. If you're married and don't know how to be married and wind up divorced, wind up in a, in a marriage not happy, not fulfilled, it's because you don't know how to work marriage. Ignorant, ignorant to it. Uninformed, misinformed, or don't know. My people are destroyed for not knowing. And, and, and us not having spiritual insight discernment about this time, about this moment in 2020. Could bring destruction to all of us. And we're not going to have it. We're not going to stand for it. Amen. So say, so say fasting. Say I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So uh, somebody called me, a family member called me. They watched the service at 9 o'clock. And, and they said, uh, a Pastor, can, can I just fast two or three days? I said, if you want to. It's a seven-day fast, though. Can I fast two or three days? Yeah, no. It's a seven-day fast. Tr trying to get out. We ain't, we ain't started in trying to get out of it. Boy, your, I know, I, I heard bodies say, I ain't doing that. When I first mentioned the fast, I heard some of y'all bodies say, I ain't doing that. Don't say amen. <laughs> I heard you, I ain't doing that. Why not? It's godly. We're going to see how biblical and strip, scriptural it is. We're going to see the benefits of it. And you ain't going to do it? I mean, is it going to hurt me? No, it ain't going to hurt you. It's going, to it's going to help you in so many ways. But see, as a man thinking in his heart, so is he. I remember the first time I fasted, I did like two or three days, and I was like, ooh, I hope I don't fall out. I hope I don't pass out. Should I drive? Should I, should I operate heavy ma machinery? Just, cause ain't, just because we ain't ate in two or three days. We, we're going to find out about hunger and all that stuff. We're going to see some good examples here. But you can do this. Say, I can do this. Look at your neighbor and say, you could do this. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be a wimp. Say, don't be a spiritual wimp. You could do this. Amen. 
afraid not to eat. You ought to be afraid to eat. Ecclesiastes say, son of man, son of man, if, if you see the sword coming in the land, he said to sound the alarm and to do what? Warn the people. If you don't warn them and they get destroyed, their blood will be on your hands. He says, however, if you warn them and they don't heed the warning, then their blood is on their own hands. So pastor is just giving us a warning that after that election, it could be some danger. It could be some, some bad things happening in our country, in our nation, and cause us some destruction, cause us some, some hurt, pain, some loss of lives, some sleepless nights, all because of an election and blowing it up and magnifying it like it's everything. God is everything, not an election. God knows how to take a, the heart of somebody and turn it. The heart, king of a heart is in his hand like a river. He could turn that thing. I, I don't care if King Kong become president. <laughs> if they vote and y'all, you know what? They, it was a write-in vote and King Kong won. And King Kong, oh, get up there. I'm the president now. I don't care less because he ain't God. He's not my God. He's not my Yahweh. He is not my Elohim, whoever it is. And we're trusting Elohim, not man. Turn to Joel chapter 2, please. Joel, Joel chapter 2. The book of Joel chapter 2. Oh, help us, Holy Spirit. It's right before Hosea, Daniel, Hosea, and then you'll find Joel chapter 2. Oh, my God. Verse number 12. Are you there? The book of Joel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, now, therefore, says Yahweh, turn to me. Say, turn to him. Amen. Say, turn to him. Amen. Now, if you tell somebody to turn to me, what does that mean? Why would you tell somebody that? Huh? They not they ain't turned to you. You know, you, when you guys are looking down, I say, look at me. Well, the reason I tell you to look up, because you're looking down. But if God says, turn to me, that means I was turning somewhere else. That means I was focused and looking somewhere else. My focus was somewhere else. Get your focus off the election and turn to him. Get your focus off the Democrats, Republicans, and independents and turn to him. Get your eyes off your boss. Get your eyes off your husband or wife and turn to him. Turn to me with all your heart. Say all my heart. Okay, look at me. Look at Pastor. Okay, say God's back there, but I ain't looking at him. And God says, turn to me. And I just, no, with all your heart. I want all of you. I want, I want all your focus on me. Don't, don't be like Lot's wife and turn around and look back. Wasn't nothing back there. There's nothing behind you worth looking at. Are y'all at Joel chapter 2, verse 12? Now therefore, says Yahweh, turn to me with all your heart. What's the next two words? Huh? The next two words, what? Turn to God with all my heart with what? Any arguments? Any debates? Any different opinions? Any arguments? Who needs an interpretation of that? Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, and weeping, and with mourning. Sound like something serious going on. Sound like something serious is going on. So rend or tear your heart and not your garments. In the Old Testament, when they would be going through something, they would tear their garments when something really uh, drastic happened. Remember when Caiaphas was in the, in the uh, planetarium with Caesar and Jesus? And, or, no, they were, in the, they were just in the temple. And they asked Jesus, was he the son of God? And he said, yeah, and Caiaphas tore his clothes, which means like, you know, that's crazy. I'm, ah, yeah, something bad is going to happen. This is really horrible. He says, instead of tearing your clothes, tear your heart open. See, that's just an outward thing, tearing your clothes. That's just some outward expression. Ooh, they serious. Ooh, this is bad. But what about if I tear my heart open? What about if you open my, your heart all the way to him? 
Tear your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord. Turn to, return to Yahweh, your Elohim, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for Yahweh, your Elohim. Blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet. The blowing of the trumpet, it signified, it acknowledged that something was about to happen. He said to, to blow the trumpet in Zion, so we blowing the trumpet in San Bernardino. Amen. We're making a declaration and a proclamation in San Bernardino, in the Calif state of California, in these United Nations. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast. What we're doing is biblical and scriptural, y'all. Call a sacred assembly. Look around you. Look around you. This is the sacred assembly we've called. This is the sacred assembly we've called. We, we've assembled ourselves. A sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. We just did that with the, with the communion. Assemble the elders. Our elders are here. Gather the children and the nursing babes. We got kids in here. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. In other words, look at y'all. With the sound of the alarm of the trumpet, with this serious fast and consecration going on, y'all finna get married, you need to stop that. that. That needs to wait. All the natural things ain't natural things. See, anything natural I'm doing, anything fleshly that I'm doing, anything of this earth I'm doing, when this fast is starting, everything else stops. Nothing else matters. Can't involve myself with nothing else. He said, you're about to get married? It got to wait. The, bride, the groom, bridegroom's in there getting ready? She got to wait. Let the priest who minister, you got to minister? He got to wait. Cry between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Spare the United States, O Lord. Yahweh, spare the United States. Y'all say that with me. Yahweh, Yahweh. Spare, spare the United States. Say, heaven, spare the United States. <sighs> let the people say, spare your, let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. That the nations should rule over them. We don't want some other nation coming, ruling over us. Why should they say among the people, where is your Yahweh? If y'all called on your Yahweh, what is the other people doing invading and taking over your land? <sighs> Turn to Jeremiah 36. It's to your left. Jeremiah 36 is to your left. Jeremiah chapter 36. Dang. Jeremiah 36, verse number 9, please. Are you there? It says, Now it came to pass in the fifth year of Joachim, the son of Joash, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaim a fast before Yahweh to some of the people in Jerusalem. Huh? So who's excluded from it? Who got a good excuse or a good reason? Now, pastor said, I'm no fool and God's no fool. And don't you be a fool. You know if you're on medication that requires you to take it with food. You know that. God knows that. So don't nobody be in no guilt or condemnation or this ain't no contest. 
However, say however. If that don't apply to you, then you in the all. Proclaim a, flat, proclaim a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people who came from Rialto, San, <laughs> Redlands, Riverside, all the surrounding areas, everybody. Proclaim, proclaim, call a fast to all the people, everybody. It's serious. We need everybody. We need everybody. We need everybody. What's going on in my belly What's going to go on in your belly for the next seven days is not more important what could go on in the United States after November the 3rd. What's going into my belly is not more important than what could be going on after November the 3rd. May not have nothing to put in your belly. Then Barak read from the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chambers of Jeremiah, the son of Saphan, the scribe in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house in the hearing of all the people. Say all the people. people. Turn to Isaiah 58, please, to your left. Isaiah 58. This one here, you're going to have to button your seatbelt on because you're going to have to button your seatbelt on this one. Isaiah 58. And then we go from Isaiah, we're going to go to Mark, Matthew 4, just so we can all keep going as fast as we can. Okay. Isaiah 58, are you there? The next scripture will be Mark 4, so just so you can kind of be ready to go. Isaiah 58, verse number 3, it says, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen, talking about God, why have we afflicted our souls? And you take no notice. God, I got this food on my mind. I'm telling it no, no, no. My body's going through this hunger. I'm telling it no, no, no. And you ain't take notice. God answers them and says, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. You, you didn't proclaim the fast. You are fasting. But you're still doing the same thing you was doing when you wasn't fasting. I like me some football. Alex is playing Monday night, um, Sunday night football tonight. The Lakers, I hope their game be over with before, <laughs> before 6 o'clock. I hope they don't lose so they have to play Tuesday. I hope, you know, I like me some sports. I really, really do. Play them, watch them, like them, et cetera, et cetera. But watch. I'm proclaiming a fast to seek God, and I'm going to watch Sunday night football, Monday night football, and Thursday night football, I ain't. Is that a pleasure to me? Yes. Is food a pleasure to me? Yes. So watch. You, God can't take notice of this. He says you're still doing the same pleasures you were doing when you fasted. I'm not going to be on social media. I like to post scriptures and, and inspirational things. I'm not going on social media. No amens on that one. I'm not going on social media. I'm, I'm not going on social media. Amen. Forget you guys. I ain't going on social media for no seven days. For I'm fasting. I'm going to keep doing the same thing. You ain't fasting. Well, Pastor, I thought it was just from food. It's from anything and everything that brings you some natural pleasure and enjoyment naturally. Because I'm doing something spiritually that's so important and so vital, I don't have time or I'm not going to give any energy to that. If you fast correctly and you fast like you're supposed to, you ain't going to have the energy for social media, football, or, or whatever else you like to do and watch. Your energy is going to, some of your energy is going to go there. And your body and your mind is going to be fighting you for a couple of days. What's more important? What's more vital? You could do this. God wants you to do this. Your pastor is encouraging you to do this. Football ain't more important than this to me. As much as I like it. You, you, you got to say, change my attitude. See, you can't be fasting and have the same nasty, mean attitude. You can't be, ma- I'm fasting, I, don't talk to me, I'm fasting. You can't be mean and fasting. You can't have no attitude and fasting. I don't like them. And you're fasting? 
I can't be in any unforgiveness and I call myself fasting. You can't be the same way and do the same thing. God says, I'm not taking notice of that. In fact, in the days you fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast from strife and debate, competition, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You act in bad. You will not fast as you do this day. You take your voice, excuse me, to make your voice heard on high. I ain't going to hear your voice on high. It is a fast that I have chosen, a day of a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Doing the same thing. TV. Say, buy TV. Buy social media. Buy telephone. I mean, you know, you answer your phone something you got to, but I'm not going to be on there just yapping. I can't, I can't talk today. I'm, I'm doing something important with the Lord. If it's that serious to us. Now, see, now a seven-day fast. Say no food. Now, you're going to be doing your body a favor. You know how hard your body been working to digest all that gunk we put in it? You're going to give your heart, your lungs, your liver, and your kidneys, and your intestines, you're going to give them a much-needed break. Hopefully in seven days, you'll be able to get that macaroni and cheese from last Christmas out, out your intestines. That old putrid food stuck in your intestines still, stuck in your colon. Cancer, all kinds of diseases come from that old putrid, putrefied um, food that's stuck inside of us. That in and out burger from January before COVID is still in there. Your body needs a break. It needs a purifying. Say more time. Do you know how much time we spend? Okay, what am I going to eat for you know, dinner, lunch, whatever? I either got to go get it from the store, take it out the freezer, whatever. I got to prepare it. I got to cook it. I got to eat it. Then I got to clean up. No dishes for seven days. No pots and pans for seven days. All that extra time to spend with the most high. Oh, God finna redeem some. He giving you back some time this week. You gonna have all the time you need to spend with him. To be in his word. My mind ain't gonna be on food. I can't, I'm not gonna let my belly be God for one week. For one week, for seven days, I'm gonna stop letting my belly be my God. Now watch, I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. You go fast for seven days, I can't do that. Well, what if something comes up that you are really going to need to do through Christ and you ain't gave Christ a chance to do something through you that you thought you couldn't do? The benefit of fasting, it expands my capacity to receive spiritually. How many of y'all in here that remember this lady in the 60s named Catherine Kuhlman. Yeah, powerful woman of God. Oh, a powerful woman of God. Talking about, talking about Benny Hinn and stuff like that. Catherine Kuhlman. And if you remember her, she'd always wear these long dresses. She looked like a scarecrow in that dress. But she lived a life of total fasting. She said she fasted all the time. She said, you've got to make yourself useful and available so God can move through you. She said, fasting and God working through you is like a pipe connected to a reservoir. You don't remember how she used to talk? Like a pipe hooked up to a reservoir. And, and the more clear and open that pipe is, the more anointing and power that can flow through it without things, obstacles, stuff clogged up in it. Worry, fear, food, whatever it might be. And she said, I just let the power flow through me. She just would walk by people, wouldn't touch them or nothing. People got healed, came out of wheelchairs. But living a fasted life. And we just going to call this fast for seven days for our nation. Can God count on us? Can God use us? Seeking him seven days, just focus on God for seven days? We can do it. We can stop the stuff. TV, all that stuff can go. All that natural fleshly stuff. I can't set that aside for seven days for him. 
to give him something to work through. You've heard this from me before. I'll say it again. When I fasted over, I don't remember how many days it was. It might have been eight or nine. But on that seventh day, I think it was, and I had been fasting, and, and I, I told Florence something is missing, something's gone, something don't feel right. And we were walking the dogs. When I got back home and went back into the prayer room, I um, was praying. And God said, that's your flesh separating from your spirit. And it was such a freedom. I don't know. I, oh, I, you can't explain it. It was such a freedom. Finally, finally putting my body under. My body had nothing to say about anything. Nothing to worry about, nothing to be concerned about, nothing to be scared about. Just free. For, Paul said, I, that's why Paul said, I, Paul said, I keep my body under. He knew the freedom. Paul fasted. He knew the freedom of that. Being free from the flesh, free from my flesh, pulling me, dominating me. Now, we call ourselves spiritual. You're here in the ecclesia. You come here. You come here. You're, you're born from above. I'm praying in other tongues. My Bible is all marked up. I, I come to church, come to Bible study, serve God, turn away from sin. But, I, and I'm not, but I'm not interested in fasting. I'm not interested in moving to a higher level in the spirit. I, I tell myself, Emilia, I can't do that. Why should I do that? Turn to Mark 4. Hurry. Excuse me, Matthew 4. Say no TV, no social media. I don't have time for it. I'm seeking God. Matthew 4. First I said Mark, Matthew 4. Oh my God, help me. Matthew 4. One to put a thousand to flight, two to put ten thousand. All of us get together and fast. That demon, that, that demon ain't going to have a chance. It says, then Yeshua, verse 1, he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Being tempted is not a sin. Yielding to the temptation, that's the sin. And when he had what? When Jesus had did what? Who want to be like Jesus? All of us do. Well, if I want to be like Jesus, like even a little guy here, look, who want to be like Jesus? He raised his little precious hand. Yeah, he want to be like Jesus. Well, Yeshua fasted. And when he fasted, and look at this, y'all, 40 days. Pastor just asked him for seven. Now, if I, if I said 40, then we could, I can see why y'all want to fight me. I can see why somebody want to run up because I said 40. Seven. Now, notice after this, it says, and afterwards, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he was what? When was he hungry? After what? After 40 days. See, after two days, you're going to think you're starving. You ain't starving. That's your addiction talking to you. That's withdrawals. Crackhead, meth head, heroin. Alcoholic, they drop it. You know what happens to them? They go through. Why? Their body is craving and asking for what it used to get. When you stop eating after 6 o'clock today, Monday, Tuesday, your body is going to start going into withdrawals and telling you what's going on. Give it to me. Give me my drug called food. Give me my fix called food. Now, Yeshua here, he did it 40 days and 40 nights. Moses did it 40 days and 40 nights. Noah, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. See, after that 40-day period, something happens. The body itself, it can, it can go without food for 40 days. After that 41st day, it goes into starvation and starts eating itself. But everything it, it eats up in that 40-day period is extra. Say extra. Say, I'm carrying 40 days of uh, extra. <laughs> I'm carrying 40 days, 40 days, I ain't going to touch nothing else. We carrying 40 days of extra somewhere. Because you don't go into starvation until the 41st day. I'm it's Wednesday, if your body tells you to say I'm starving, your body's lying to you. That's withdrawals. Now, when you fast, water, 
Herbal teas are best. Apple juice. Don't mess with no orange juice or grapefruit juice because you want to keep acid out of you. You want to know why? Because your stomach will be giving you some free acid. It's going to say, wait a minute. Don't we have some food in here by this time? And your brain will be sending a signal. It's time to eat. It's time to eat. And your body, the intestine will start doing them juices. And you don't want to add no acid to that. So water, lots of water, lots of water, herbal tea, juices, apple juice, something like that with no acid in it. And you could do it. You're going to be so glad after you do it. I promise you this. After seven days, you're not going to want to stop. And if you've never done it past seven days, that's why you're getting said amen. After seven days, you're not going to want to stop. He was hungry. Now when the tempter, not if, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of Yahweh, command that these stones become bread. Look at pastor. You are going to attract some demonic spirits in this fast. You are going to attract some demonic spirits during this fast. Because fasting is going to attract and open you up to the spirit realm. See, we think we've been really having some battles with the enemy. You're going to find out about some battles this week if you've never experienced this before. If you are the Son of God, command these, bread, these stones become bread. But he answered and said to him, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Elohim. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the bane of Yahweh, throw yourself down, for it is written, you shall, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in your hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Yeshua said to him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your Yahweh. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the churches. What did he show him? What did he show him? Look at pastor. Satan ain't interested in churches. He's interested in kingdoms. He wants to dominate kingdoms. He, the government don't care about us. Society don't care about us. And Satan don't care about us. He cares about kingdoms and governments. Because that's where the power source is. That's where changes are made. That's where authority lies. And he took Jesus up on the high place and showed him the kingdoms and the worlds, the cosmos. Showed them the governments of those kingdoms. He didn't show him nothing about no religion. He showed him about kingdoms, about governments. Because that's what he rules over. And showed him all the kingdoms of the cosmos, of the governments, and their glory. And he said to him, all these things. What things, y'all? What things are you talking about? Kingdoms and governments. All these kingdoms and governments I'll give to you. How can you give something that don't belong to you? How can you give something that you don't have? If you bow down and worship me, all these kingdoms and these governments, I'll put them into your hands. Because I'm the God of this world and they're in my hands now. Jesus didn't tell Satan, you liar, you're, a father, you're the father of lies, you're lying. He didn't tell him he was lying. So he must have been able to and have the capacity and the authority to transfer those kingdoms and governments over to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, away with me, away with you, Satan, for it's written, you shall, not, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, Malachim, angels came and ministered to him. Jesus didn't debate with him that if he couldn't give those kingdoms and government systems to him. Because he knew that that's what Satan was ruling over. He's ruling over that in America. And the demon principality that rules over America is mad, it's upset, upset, it wants to go to war because of what's going on in the political arena. And we want to fight this thing in the spirit. You go ahead and go to the voting booth, but we're going to fight this in the spirit. Ain't changing nothing in the voting booth, but names, shuffling names. You ain't shuffling no authority. You ain't going you, you to 
check, do your do our X, check, whatever, however you do, do that thing. We ain't going to do that and change authorities and principalities in the spirit realm. We'll do it. We're going to go and do it. But we know we ain't changing nothing in the spirit realm. So Yeshua fasted, I'm going to fast. Jesus said, when you fast, don't do like the hypocrites and show up ashy, hair over your head, no makeup on, and looking sad so people can ask you what's wrong with you. I'm fasting. You got your reward. Now, we could talk about it because this is the ecclesia. This is God's kingdom, his government. We're having a meeting. We could talk about it. And so he said, if you, you got your reward already if you do it before men and show off like that. The, the religious folk was getting on Jesus one time. Why aren't your disciples fasting? And Jesus said, when the bridegroom leaves, then they're going to have to fast. So he left. So now it's, it's been time for us to fast. Second Chronicles 20. It's serious. It's serious. It's serious, people. It's serious body of Christ. Second Chronicles 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20, please. Are you there? Verse number one. It says, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites, they came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea of Syria, and they are in Hazan, Tamar, which is in Engindai, in and Jehoshaphat feared. Say his first response. See, you and I want to get to a point that when we hear bad news, we hear a bad report, our first response is not fear. Because God never co-signs fear. I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. Power, love, and a sound mind. Fear not, for I'm with you always, even till the end of time. So the natural response to bad news is fear. But we're not going to fear. So he feared, he messed up, but then he got himself together and set himself to seek the Lord. Okay? And proclaimed, what's the next two words? Proclaimed what? After the bad news, what did he do? Honey, we can't pay that bill. Let's fast. Honey, something happened to the kids. Let's fast. Something happened in that work. Let's fast. Something's happened in the government. Let's call a fast. The doctor said this about my body. Let's fast. He got bad news. He was outnumbered, overwhelmed. He feared at first, set himself to see God. Then he said, let's fast. Let's give up everything natural to get a victory. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all San Bernardino. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. From Rialto, from Retina, from Yakaipa, from Merino Valley, from Crestline, from Big Bear, from um, Pomona, from Ontario. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, he started giving his testimony. He's going legal now. He's giving testimony. O Lord our father, our, of our fathers, are you not Elohim in heaven? And do you not rule over all the churches? Amen. What does God rule over? Amen. Don't you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? God's interested in kingdoms and nations, not churches. And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our Elohim who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and gave it to your descendants of Abraham, your friend forever, and they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, covid an election? 
We will stand before this temple and in your presence for your name is in this temple and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. We stand in the presence of the Most High and we're crying out in the affliction in this land right now. And we make a proclamation as we cry out to the Most High that he will save this land. We are fasting for him to make a move and save this nation. Now notice he put God's name in there. He's saying, since I'm making this proclamation in your name, Father, your name is at stake. I want God to put his name on this so his name and his reputation. When God's name is on something, when God's reputation is at stake, God's going to protect that and move on that. That's why you want his name on you, on your house, on your money, on your family. Because he's going to move when his name is someplace, when a king puts his name on something. When a king puts his name on something, that's his reputation. That's who he is. When the queen of Sheba came to check out Solomon, before she got to Solomon, she found out who he was. Look at your servants. Look at your house. Look what they're eating. Look what they're wearing. She saw his name before she saw Solomon. We want him to put his name on this fast. Because he's going to always exalt and protect his name. I want his name on my house. I want his name on my money. I want his name on my family. I want his name in my mind. I want his name in my heart. I want his name on my motives. I'm not fasting for me. I'm fasting in his name. You ain't fasting to lose weight, although you might lose some weight. You ain't fasting because this is a diet. This ain't a diet. You're not fasting to look holy or spiritual. You're putting his name on this fast. You are sanctifying yourself and consecrating yourself. And all the outside stuff I used to do, all the outside stuff I used to do is not worthy to be in this presence right now. Verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. I don't know what to do after November the 3rd, but I'm going to look to him. We don't know what to do, but he does. When you fast and pray and seek God, he gives you a plan. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Tell your kids, no games, no computers this week. We fasting. Now I'm not telling you to have no kids fast for no seven days. I'm not telling you that. But they can show fast them games. Look at mama, daddy's fasting TV. No, well, Pastor, I got to eat. I got a prescription. Well, he didn't give you no prescription for TV. I got a prescription. I got to watch. So I got to do social media. You ain't got no prescription for social media. You gonna live without it. You can live without social media. You ain't got no prescription for it. I can live without football. I ain't got no. The doctor didn't tell me. Well, Pastor Stewart, you better watch football twice a week. Or I don't know how things will work out for you. Now all of Judah and their little ones, their wives and their children stood before Yahweh. Then, say then. Now that, remember, they're in a fast. They're praying. They're giving testimony. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jezal, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benai, the son of Jael, the son of Maniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the middle of the assembly. And he said, listen. All of you inhabitants of San Bernardino, California, United States of America, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says Yahweh to you, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but Yahweh's. When I fast and pray, I get clarity on whose battle this is. When you're in the flesh and in the natural, you're trying to do it yourself. When you get free of yourself, you'll get spiritual clarity you never had before. You'll be able to see who really is fighting this battle. He 
never proclaimed or said that before this fast. He had never heard that before this fast. You're going to see things and hear things you never saw and heard before you fasted. Verse number 16. Tomorrow, go down against the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the Position yourselves and stand still and see. Y'all just keep fasting and praying. Stand still and you're going to see. The salvation of Yahweh, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear. Look how many times you got to tell them, don't be afraid. Or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out against them. Why? Why should I? I'm outnumbered. Because Yahweh's with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord to worship. See, when I fast and see God, I find out who the battle belongs to. I find out and turn everything over to the one who's able to do. They said, we don't know what to do, but he does. I turn the battle over to him and I get free. See, you last longer free. You last longer in peace than you do in fighting. Hold my peace and I'm going to see the salvation. I'm going to see the deliverance. I'm going to see the help. I'm going to see the protection. I'm going to see the victory. I'm going to see the deliverance. I'm going to see my help. I'm going to see those things if I could stand still and just keep my focus on him. And fasting gives me that capacity to function like that in the middle of a battle. Turn to your right to the book of Esther, and we're going to finish on that. That was just my opening statement. And don't be rushing me. If you got to leave, I love you, and I'll see you later. But don't rush me. This is too important. This is too vital. Or else you think we just playing church or something. And what's the point anyway? <clears throat> okay, look at Pastor. Our fasting and repair, our fasting and praying is going to replace food. It's going to replace TV. It's going to replace the computer. It's going to replace fellowshipping. It's going to replace doing all this other stuff we used to do. We're doing a corporate fast. We got to do this together. You can do a personal fast and a corporate fast. We're calling this a corporate one. We're all in this together. We ain't going to let each other down. We, I need you. You need me. We need each other. We're not fasting to change God. We're fasting to change us. We're not trying to manipulate God. We're changing ourselves. I, I'm going to prove to myself that I really am spiritual. That, that my spirit man is really stronger than this natural man. That I I'm, I'm really am walking in the spirit because I'm no longer yielding to the flesh and putting a spoon and a fork in my mouth. Because I'm, I'm, I'm willingly doing this. Like I told my relative, I said, you don't want to do it. Yes, I do. Well, why are you asking me, can you just do three days? And I told you it's a seven-day fast. Don't do it. You don't want to. I, you know, I, I want, I'm, I'm hungry and thirsty for God. Unfortunately, no, you're not. Be truthful and honest. I, I don't really want that much of God. I got enough God. I got, just, I got enough. I'm cool with this amount. I'm cool with this amount of God. It ain't that serious, Pastor. Okay, it ain't that serious. It was serious for Esther. Esther chapter 3. Look at verse number 8. Book of Esther. It says, Then Haman said to King Osiris, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. In other words, there's these sanctified people in your kingdom. And their laws are different from all other people. And they do not keep the government's law or the king's law. Look at Pastor. Y'all can't have church. I ain't keeping that law. Y'all can't assemble. I ain't keeping that law. 
Ain't you supposed to follow the laws of the land? <laughs> Not if they go against the laws of God. They don't keep your law, king. Therefore, is it not fitting for the king to let them remain? Don't let them stay in your kingdom and they won't do what you say. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written, because see, all the king got to do is say something and it becomes law, that they be destroyed. Oh, my God, we better do it. They're going to come get us. And I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do. Whoever go get them and bust them up for you, king, I'll pay them. And I'll bring that money into your treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of that dude, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as you seem good. Oh, my God, they in trouble. They in trouble. I'm going to try to cut this down, y'all. Okay. Mm, still long. Okay, go to chapter 4. Esther, chapter 4. Now, this is Esther's uncle, Mordecai. Now, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he learned that there was a warrant out for all the Jews. The king had made a decree to wipe them all out, and it tells you earlier what we just passed. It says the little ones, the young folk, the old folk, kids, women, everybody, kill them, wipe them out. And so when Mordecai heard that, verse 1, chapter 4, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great, uh, great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, hey, something about to pop off. They're about to kill all your people. And the queen was deeply distressed. Your uncle Mordecai, he out there with no clothes on. So then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him. But he would not accept them. I don't want them. I don't want nothing natural. Don't dress me up. I'm, I'm doing something spiritual right now. Then Esther called Hattach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend to her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So the Mordecai he went to the city square, went to the king's gate, and asked Mordecai what was popping off, and he told him. Look at verse number 10. Then Esther spoke to Hatchet and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, say has not been called. He, which is the king, he has but one law put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out his golden scepter, they may live. In other words, whoever comes to the king's house, unannounced, uninvited, they all got to die, but the king will pick out one who can live. He, she says, yet I myself, I ain't been called to go into the king these last 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Your niece says she ain't going in there because the king ain't invited her. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do you think in your heart that you're going to escape the king's palace any more than any other Jews? When he find out you're a Jew, Esther, he's going to kill you too. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and a deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Say another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You sitting up in here, y'all, for this fast for such a time as this. You ain't just here because it's Sunday. You ain't just here because you decided to come to church. God has you here to hear this for such a time as this for that election after November 3rd. And he told Esther, if you don't let God use you, he going to find somebody else. God, you ain't got to find nobody else. Here I am. Say, God. Say, Father. You don't have to look for anyone else. I'm here, and I'm available. See, this is what you, see, when you're religious and churched out, this is what you don't understand. Without God, we can't do nothing. We got that. Well, how about this part? Without us, he won't do nothing. Without God, we can't do what we need to do. But without us, he won't do nothing. Why? Because it's illegal to do something in the earth realm without a body. We got bodies, God is spirit, so he has to work through us.
Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Okay, I got the message. I got it. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Look at Pastor. Esther saying, if I don't do something, I'm in the right position. I do got access to go into the king's house. And if I don't do something, God will have to use somebody else. The Jews going to get wiped out. My, my nation's going to get wiped out. I'm going to go in, but tell my uncle to get the people together and tell them to fast for me. Tell them to give up all the natural stuff and move into the spirit realm because I'm about to do something that can cost me my life. Now look at the fast she called. Neither eat or drink. Oh my God. For three days, night or day. And she said, my maids and I, we're going to do the same thing. Now that's a hard fast. No food or water. I ain't telling you to do that. And so, listen, it's to say it's against the law. Say it's against the law. And so, after this fast, I will go to the king, which is against the law. The laws of the land, like I ain't going to go in there, but I'm going to do it. And if I die, and if he kill me, I'm just going to have to die. Fasting makes you bold. You get through a fast, you can get through anything. Now, I know I'm breaking the law right now. I know the king said you can't just come in here like this. But I know how vital and important it is for my nation. So, y'all fast for me. I'm going to go into the king. And if he kill me, he going to just have to kill me. How many people are down like that for God? If they come take me to jail, just come take me to jail. If y'all going to find me, just come find me. If you're going to threaten me, just come threaten me. But I'm going to do the Lord's will. Well, I don't care what happens to me. See, what has you in bondage and what has a hold on you, you are too tethered to this realm. You have too much concern about this realm for God to use you in his realm. It's when I get free from this realm when he can use me. Because he knows there's no constraints here that will influence me or stop me. So here go Miss Esther. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne, place of authority and judgment, in the royal house facing the entrance at the house. So it was... When the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, say unannounced, uninvited, out of pocket, illegal. That she found favor, oh my God. Look at Pastor. She would have never found out that she had that favor if she hadn't have showed up. You scared to go somewhere, scared to do some things, and you ain't going to find out the favor that's on your life till you put your life in jeopardy. Till you put yourself in jeopardy, that's when you're going to find out the favor that's on your life. You can't find out hiding now. You can't find out scared. You can't find out wondering. You're going to have to walk by faith and step out there with God to find out the favor. It was waiting on her. She wasn't going to go until Mordecai. Sometimes pastor's pushing you. Mordecai had to push her. I'm your Mordecai this morning. I'm pushing you to go out there and find out the favor that's waiting on you. You don't know till you get out there. You don't know till you step out beyond yourself. There's favor waiting for you, but you are afraid to find out. You need a Mordecai to push you. Found favor in the sight of the king. And then what did the king say, y'all? What did he say? Huh? What do you want? Pointed his scepter at her. Picked her out. 
because she's on kingdom business, on a kingdom assignment, and she's trusting God. And the king said, what do you want? And she told him, they're trying to kill my people. And so the king flipped that script, and that guy, what was his name, whatever his name was, his house got destroyed, him and his group got destroyed, and Esther wound up being the top queen in the, in the house. She would have never found out the favor waiting on her if she hadn't have been brave enough and bold enough to go step out to the king that was against the governmental rule at the time. And the king gave her favor. And when the king gave you favor, he asked you, what do you want? During your fast, God going to ask you, the king is going to ask you during this fast, what do you want? You better, be ready. you better have your answer ready. You better get you an answer ready right now. When the king asks you, what do you want? Have your, have your answer ready. See, some of y'all don't, some of y'all don't even know what you want. You come up before the king with some D's and D's, uh, uh, E or uh, Mary had a little lamb, E-I-E-I-O. Esther knew it. Esther came into the court. She came in her knowing what she wanted. The reason you ain't been able to come into the court, you don't even know what you want yet. What do you want? And the king gave her what she wanted. At the end of this fast, the king going to give you what you want. You're going to have some some experience you hadn't had before. God's using you like he's never used you before. We stand making a stand for this nation. We're making a stand for this nation. Father, we're declaring, decreeing, and, and making a plea to you on behalf of this nation after this election, Father, that we live a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness, that death and destruction cannot and will not come upon this nation. Other nations will not invade us and destroy us because we're in strife and division, because we're in disagreement. Because we're complaining, Father God. You've blessed us and the nation's complaining. We take all those complaints, Father God, and we cancel them now. We take all the division and the strife, Father God, and we pray and lift up peace to you. Wholeness and soundness in this nation. We, your people, dwell here. We proclaim your name here. And with your name on us, you will protect us and that which concerns us. So we just thank you, Lord. Praise you and worship you right now. As we proclaim and consecrate ourselves for this seven-day fast. To seek your face. To hear your voice. And to have direction. Favor from the king. With no fear. With no fear. Father, I lift this congregation up to you, those watching by Facebook and YouTube, Father God, that they join us for the nation's sake. And victory, Father God, comes to us. November the 4th will not be a day of turmoil and chaos and destruction. But we just thank you and praise you, Father God, for your protecting grace and your mercy. It's in Yeshua's name that I pray. Amen and amen. Are we off, Carl? Are we off? Okay. Turn this off. Woo! Hallelujah. Okay, I ain't forgot about the tithes and the offerings. You, since you guys are such a good class, I'm going to let you pay tithes and offerings. I started to cancel tithes and offerings today because y'all was looking a little mean about this food thing. <laughs> so you got five hours. Florence made me some red beans and rice. Porterhouse steak and cornbread. <laughs> I got five hours to get to it. 